What I would like to discuss today is not actually part of the A-level physics specification, however, it is just incredibly interesting. And that is the topic of imaginary numbers. The concept of imaginary numbers actually started in ancient Greece, however, it wasn't officially and properly defined until the 16th century by an Italian mathematician by the name of Gerolamo Cardano. Now, um, what they set out to do was to be able to solve every algebraic equation. I'm sure when, even when you've been going through your GCSEs or maybe even earlier, you might have come up with a situation in which uh, you have a negative number and you need to take the square root of that negative number. And at that point, your teacher must have, uh, probably would have said that that is not allowed. So. Those, math, those early mathematicians tried to get around that problem and be able to represent a solution to every algebraic equation by assuming the following, that the square root of minus one is an imaginary number. It was called an imaginary number because they were assumed to be completely fictitious, completely not relating to nature. Now, when you study physics, particularly at university level, you're going to come across some functions which, in which you can have an imaginary component which becomes very, very useful. For example, functions which are differentiated twice and uh, need to have the negative of the original function are very, very useful to be represented by an exponential raised to the power of i. However, you could also equally represent them with a sine or a cosine function. One of the things that I've been thinking about recently, though, has been quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is very unique in that not only is our imaginary numbers very useful for quantum mechanics, but they also seem to be an inherent part of the reality of quantum mechanics. So what was originally assumed to be fictitious actually seems to be an inseparable part of, um, of quantum mechanics and hence sort of reality, which is absolutely fascinating. So let's have a look at the mathematics behind that. Okay, folks, so let's have a look at a practical example of what an imaginary number is. As we said, they're defined as the square root of negative 1 is equal to i. Okay, well, let's go to look at the good old quadratic equation formula. ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. And as we've studied in school, the roots of this equation are given by minus b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Well, what we can do is um, let's think of a, a pretty simple example. So what I'm going to say is that x squared, so x squared plus x plus let's say 3 is equal to 0. So in this case, a is actually going to be 1, b will be 1, and c is going to be 3. So let's find the roots of this equation. We know that the two roots are going to be given by minus b. So that's minus 1 plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 1 squared, which is just 1, minus 4ac. So it's going to be 4 multiplied by 1, which is just 4, times c, which is 3. Okay, and we're going to be dividing that by 2a because a is 1. This means that simply dividing it by 2. Okay, well, that means that x is going to equal minus 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 minus 4 times 3 is 12 all over 2. Okay, now we're going to see that this square root is, is, is going to be negative, so let's just write that. So x will be minus 1 plus or minus the square root of minus 11 over 2. So kind of we've reached an impasse at the moment with our standard notion of algebra. This uh, negative number uh, is actually undefined. However, 
luckily to the rescue we have the knowledge that we've just decided to call this um, the square root of minus 1 be equal to i. Let's see whether we can solve this equation with that knowledge. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just play around with this a little bit more. So I'm going to say that x will be minus 1 plus or minus the square root of 11 over 2, so that's minus 5.5. Well, what we can do is uh, represent this square root of minus 5.5 as uh, having two parts really uh, such as this so that this will be minus one plus or minus the square root of minus one times the square root of 5.5 well hang on a minute if you remember what we did before i'm just going to do it out on the side is that we said that the square root of minus one is equal to i so this expression here is actually equal to i. So now we have found a solution to um, to our equation in the uh, what is known as the complex plane, and that solution is minus one plus or minus i multiplied by the square root of 5.5. So this imaginary number allows us to solve all algebraic equations. As I said, they were initially thought to be just a mathematical, completely fictitious curiosity. However, quantum mechanics tells us something really different. Let's have a look. Okay, folks, now let's see how do imaginary numbers emerge through the theory of quantum mechanics. In order to do so, we're going to need to talk a little bit about Schrodinger's equation and this peculiar mathematical property called the wave function. Now, you've probably heard that quantum mechanics is all about probabilities. Well, this wave function, this strange mathematical quantity, which is typically given the, uh, the Greek letter Psi, and it's a function of position and time, tells us what the probability of finding a particle at a given time, at a given position actually is. And the rule is that the square of the amplitude of this wave function actually give us, gives us the probability of uh, finding the particle at a given position at a given time. Now, this wave function is actually dynamic. It changes with position and it changes with time. The equation which describes that, I'm just gonna write it down um, over here, is that I h bar multiplied by the time derivative of this wave function is equal to the Hamiltonian operator applied to that function. Now you might be a little bit confused if this is the first time you've seen this equation um, or the Hamiltonian operator is. You, for the purpose of this you can just assume that it's a mathematical function that is uh, applied to this, to, 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 to this wave function. However, the really interesting um, bit when it comes to to complex numbers is um, is this so in quantum mechanics the wave function has got to have an imaginary component now why is that so let's for a moment let's assume that the wave function psi is uh, is real so uh, psi is a member of uh, the real number set. There's no imaginary component. There's no I anywhere in that uh, in that function. Well, if that's the case, then we'll have a mathematical contradiction because the left-hand side of this equation will clearly be imaginary. So this here will be imaginary, and the one here on the right. The Hamiltonian, which is applied to the wave function, this is going to be real. Well, we cannot really have that. We cannot 
have an equation in which the left hand side is imaginary but then the right hand side is real so we have reached a contradiction in this case so we know that the wave function this mathematical quantity which tells us the probability of finding a particular particle at a given time at a given position has got to be imaginary so this imaginary number the square root of minus one is equal to i even though it was assumed to be a complete mathematical curiosity in the 16th and 17th century and later on actually seems to be a fundamental part of nature this is a really really inter interesting philosophical question and i'm curious to hear your thoughts about this so um if you'd like to add anything if you'd like me if you'd like to draw my attention to an interesting article or a video please um feel free to leave a comment down below and also consider subscribing thank you very much